الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. الحمد لله. Welcome to everybody on this breakout session called Modern Day Ibn Battuta. Or even we're going to have to say Bint Battuta. We've got a sister here also. So Alhamd it's a pleasure to welcome you guys. My name is Muhammad Ishtia and I'm going to be a moderator. So again, Alhamd we are blessed to have Sister Hina here, who is the chief editor of Muslim Matters. Then we have a 30 mosque man, who is our brother Aman Ali. And then we have a 50 mosque man. Alhamdulillah, one day inshallah we'll hit 100. So we stopped up to 50. So Alhamdulillah, they're going to be sharing their journeys, their spiritual and physical journeys, into the different parts of America. Alhamdulillah. Bridging the gaps between the different faiths, going out there, letting them know that the Muslims are not just about words, but we are about action. Alhamdulillah. And this is what Isna is about, the narrative of the American uh, Muslim. Narrative, alhamdulillah. So, first and foremost, I'd like to invite forward the Mu'addin, also known as the 50 Mosque Man, who's going to be reading some ayahs from Surah, the best of stories mentioned in the Quran from Surah Tadusa. So, without further ado, inshallah, we have our brother Jamil Sayyid. Citation, my brother Jamil Sayyid, 
Alhamdulillah, how this session is going to break down is that we're going to have our, Alhamdulillah, personalities speaking for a certain amount of time, but it's going to be more of an interactive session. So, inshallah, if you guys got any questions, burning questions for them, what kind of difficulties they've had in their journeys or, you know, a highlight or whatever, inshallah, you're more than welcome to ask them, inshallah, towards the end of the session. So, I'd like to invite forward Sister Hina Zubaydi. She is the editor-in-chief of MuslimMatters.org, an award-winning web magazine. She's also a community organizer. She's been doing this, mashallah, tabarakallah, for years. She resides in Washington, D.C., where she is the staff reporter for the Muslim Link newspaper. Hina transi transitioned from television into print and social journalism after working as a TV news reporter and producer for CMDC Asia and World Television News, which is now called Associated Press TV. Alhamdulillah, she's very, very involved in the community. Alhamdulillah, goes out within the community, not only within the masjid, but also in other areas of the community. Alhamdulillah, spreading her wisdom. So, inshallah, join me in welcoming Sister Hina Zubayr. As you travel, you soak up the soul of a place and it becomes a part of you. It changes you and your lived experiences become a part of your soul. This is what I've learned from my journey. We talk about Ibn Battuta, Muhammad Abdullah, Abdullah, Abu Abdullah Muhammad Ibn Battuta. He was a 14th century Muslim scholar and traveler from Morocco who traveled to countries within the Dar es Salaam. He recorded his observation in a book called The Rahla. This book is now considered a source of recorded history. I started out my career in television news. I worked for what is now known as Associated Press Television. And then, and then at the age of 24, I helped set up the first bureau for CNBC Asia in Islamabad, Pakistan. My work took me all over Pakistan during the time where Pakistan was testing nuclear, nuclear weapons, um, we were in very tense relationship with India and, um, and the Afghan war was going on. Uh, it, was a, it was very uncommon at that time to see a woman with a camera crew walking through the villages and towns of Pakistan and in the, it was the early 1990s. I was turned away from entering Afghanistan because I did not have my mahram with me while non-Muslim journalists um, crossed over the border. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala must have known what was better for me. That, at that point in my journey was a big disappointment because I felt like, why can't I go in there? Um, but alhamdulillah, I can't imagine what my career would have been like now if they, I had crossed into the border dressed like this, subhanAllah. It was pioneering work that laid the foundations for many, many more young women. As I pro progressed in my own spiritual journey, I wasn't very observant during high school, not really understanding the culture, um, the cultural Islam that I saw practiced. But studying the Quran and then embracing the hijab, I came to a point in my life where I was at peace. But I didn't find many opportunities for women of color to practice my faith and be a part of mainstream media here in the United States. This was my new home. And it was a new experience for me. I was a third culture kid. I was raised up in several different countries in Africa and the Gulf. 
and I changed homes, schools, and high schools so often that I didn't really know what home was. Alhamdulillah, um, I transitioned into print journalism um, through as a homeschooling mother of four. I often didn't meet people who were like me, who thought like me, or my community thought I was just a little bit off. I was the only homeschooler in my uh, very small community in Southern California. Um, and I started searching online on the internet for souls, for other souls out there who had to think like me. They had to. And mashallah, I found a community online and I started blogging for Muslim Matters. At that time, Muslim Matters was a group blog. Now, alhamdulillah, Muslim Matters is one of the most widely read website, web magazine for Muslims residing in the West. It's geared for people who want to practically um, live their faith. As you can see, some of the things that we covered, this is just the front page as of today. Um, the track and field world championships just took place. Where are Muslims, athletes supposed to find out who won and who was Muslim? This gives our young people something to look toward, uh, towards to emulate. Um, the Muslim Manga Project. How many of the young kids in over, in, over here are into manga? How many of the older people, folks, know what manga is? Well, you come to Muslim Matters to find out. Um, we, we cover travels of young scholars as they go overseas to study Islam. And then we have a very vibrant Islam section, which addresses everything from how un-Islamic ISIS is to the Ayat al Kursi. Over the issues, years, we have addressed issues such as racism, pornography, sexual abuse, mental health, as practicer, practitioners of normative Islam. And because these, and we did this because these issues were not being discussed on in our pulpits or in our on our pulpits or in our halakas. However, the blogging world evolved with Facebook. There was a lot of microblogging, and we, re -evolved, we evolved too, and now we've become a um, web magazine. Alhamdulillah, we receive millions of hit, uh, hits and re are read all over the world with a staff of 45 writers, editors, and other graphic staff. Um, and alhamdulillah, we are able to dictate our own narratives as we, as our stories journey through social media and reach, and, and we have a global reach, alhamdulillah, we have readers in Nigeria, in places like Burma, we'll get um, emails from them that uh, Muslim, American Muslims are an inspiration to them, subhanAllah. I also work for a faith-based newspaper that covers the DC metro region. And my work as a journalist has taken me on a physical journey into our masajid and our communities, from annual food festivals to fundraisers, oh, so many fundraisers, and many masjid grand openings to murders in our community. Because we need Muslim media. Who's talking to our own community? Who's, who's um, chronicling the dialogues that are occurring within the Muslim communities? What, are we addressing the problems that we ourselves are facing, not through someone else's lens, but through our own lens? The three winners' death was an act of terrorism for the Muslim community. No one else, you will not find this termed terrorism in any front page except for on Muslim media. We've covered issues such as the right to pray in school, this is Tajuddin Sabri. I met him while, interview, while uh, attending a building con construction conference. This young man was standing in the food um, stamps line. He is now the owner of a company that uh, has 75 employees. And you know how he got here within one year of time? He said, I kept the fast of Da'ud alayhi salam. He fasted every other day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed that spiritual journey with a lot of money. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, he's doing really well and he employs so many Muslims. Afia Siddiqui, how many, how many mainstream uh, newspapers are going to cover her through, her through a lens that really understands her? She's been sentenced to 80 years in prison for no actual crime. The masjid burnt down in California. This, was, this occurred in the 1990s. 
This was the largest rally of Palestinian uh, Americans for, of Americans supporting Palestinians in DC was not covered by majority mainstream media. These are the Uyghurs based in D Virginia. They have formed a government and in exile. Um, covering their story was probably one of the one something that shook my soul. I'm just going to say a little bit to the, I don't, just have two more minutes and perhaps I'll come up, cover some of the other things I wanted to talk about uh, in our Q&A. Um, I really, really want to talk to the young women out there. We don't have to let go of the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be successful. I am often the only woman at the National Press Club dressed like this. Alhamdulillah, my work becomes da'wah. So many questions come up that have nothing to do with this story. And I, feel, I find that this is a blessing. I feel that as a homeschooling mother, I still homeschool two daughters. I am able to do this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed my work because I have held on and I really, really believe this. And I have tawakkul, a reliance totally on the sake of, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with lots and lots and lots of du'a. I find a lot of times when we come, we speak about Muslim women, we, uh, or coming into mainstream media, or media itself, in any media, we find that we, we're, we're asked to let go of our faith in many different small ways that just chip away at our foundations. And I really want to say, I can vouch for this. You can do it all. Dua, holding on to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, puts barakah in your lives, that, and it has in my life. It has been a journey and I am humbled that I'm able to comment and record the history of American Muslims in the capital of the United States. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khairan. Alhamdulillah. We move on inshallah to our next speaker. Again, when we see traditional Islam, we used to see people going from one mosque to another mosque, teaching people. But now we have so many beautiful initiatives going on, alhamdulillah, to promote Islam. Not just bounded to the masjid, but alhamdulillah, going out to different states, maybe to different countries even. Alhamdulillah. So next our speaker is going to be, inshallah, the 30th mosque man. It's going to be our brother, Aman Ali. He is an award-winning storyteller in New York City and one of the most popular social media personalities in the Muslim community today. And also as we go along in this, in this breakout session, you got your cell phones on you. Hashtag the Mu'addin of Brother Aman Ali. So this is how it spreads. And also Brother Aman, his, compassion, his passionate and animated tales, he regularly posts to Facebook continuously attract thousands of hits, thousands of likes. Alhamdulillah. He is one of only a few young American Muslims in the public spotlight today. He's made appearances on just about every major news outlet, including New York Times, CNN, HBO, BBC, which is a personal favorite of mine. And alhamdulillah, NPR. So, Brother Aman Ali is one of the brothers who went during Ramadan hitting a mosque every single day. And mashallah, tabarakallah, I can remember him coming into IAGD on Eid day with a big massive uh, camera. Alhamdulillah, we had been following him the whole of Ramadan and then he finishes in Michigan coming from Ohio. There's that rivalry between Ohio State and Michigan State, which we love. It's not much more rivalry. Oh, that's right. Is it? Is it? Okay, he's right. On the scoreboard, there isn't. Alhamdulillah. He's also working on a new film series with Google on the American Muslim community called Homegrown Homies. And it's a film, film series which just featured last week on the Today Show. Alhamdulillah, brother. Aman Ali is also going to be speaking about social media in room number 31 after our session here. So inshallah again, you know, join me in welcoming Brother Aman Ali.
Check, check, we good? Oh, I gotta switch this up. This is yours. People in the back, you guys mind moving up? I'm not gonna bite you. I'm friendly. Got my shots? You good? Got some shots. Okay, cool. Um, so, give you guys a little bit of background. So, I live in New York City, uh, but I originally grew up in Ohio. Um, and when I moved to New York, I'm not a native New Yorker by any means, um, but a friend of mine who's a filmmaker, um, all of our friends were all like creative types, like my friend's a musician, another guy uh, plays a piano, another guy is a photographer. So, we all come from like a very creative uh, circle. But, so, during Ramadan, all of them were traveling, like all to different parts of the world, like doing stuff. And so, me and my buddy, uh, Bassam Tariq, we were just stranded in New York by ourselves. And we found out that in New York City, there's 163 mosques within a 10 mile radius of where we live. And so how it all began, in 2009, um, I put out a tweet on uh, Twitter and status on uh, Facebook that said, because the Muslim community in New York is so big, my friend and I are going to iftar. If you don't know, iftar is a meal to break the fast. At a different masjid, masjid is a fancy word for a mosque, every single day. So that was our plan. To, it was just something that I posted to my friends. And people started messaging us left and right, like, hey, that's so cool. Y'all should really blog about it. You should really blog about it. I'm like, blogs are dumb. Like, I don't read blogs. Like, why would I want to write one? Like, that's dumb. And they just kept insisting, like, you guys need to blog about it. You guys should really, really blog about this. And so, just to shut them up, we're like, all right, fine, stop annoying me. Like, fine, we'll put up this blog just to, like, you know, uh, satisfy them. So, we launched the blog in 2009, just going around New York City initially. So, we launched the blog 30 months and 30 days. Um, so that was our blog, and that's me before the baldness kicked in. Um, thank you, sister, for laughing at my insecurities. Um, and so we launched the blog, and what was really cool was not only was our family and friends uh, reading the blog, uh, we started getting emails from all over the country, and then I was in like, hey, I'm in London, I love reading your blogger. Hey, I'm in China, I love reading your blogger. Hey, I'm in Luxembourg, I love reading your blog. I'm like, dude, I don't even know where Luxembourg is, but that's awesome that you guys are reading the blog. And so we had this great time in New York in 2009. But the thing is, uh, we had a great time in New York, but I knew that our experience is not exclusive to New York, that there's all these dope communities around the country that we can check out in my background as a performer. And my friend Bassam Tarek, who's a filmmaker uh, and a photographer for National Geographic and Time Magazine, we've done our own fair share of travel around the country, and we knew that there's all these cool communities around the US that we could check out. And so we are like, dude, wouldn't it be even more crazy if we went to 30 mosques in 30 days, in 30 states? So that's how that happened, and that's how this happened. And so this was our route uh, the first year we did it. Um, we started in New York, went up to Maine, down to Florida, out to California, and basically made our way back, essentially doing an outline of the country. So we did those 30 states, and then the next year, we finished the remaining 20, then we overlapped 10 for the other ones. And so we started in Alaska that time, went all the way down the coast, flew out to Hawaii, obviously, uh, and then went back and then all made our way back uh, to New York. And so in two years, uh, we covered all 50 states and Washington, D.C., and doing uh, about 27,000 miles of driving. And so a lot of people would ask us, like, uh, we humbly we got a lot of great press coverage uh, for this uh, project. And reporters would always ask us, like, oh, are you trying to promote a positive, image of Muslims, we always told them no. Our intention is just to tell an honest story about Muslims because what I was seeing on television was not the same thing I was seeing in reality. The Muslims I saw on TV were not the Muslims I saw the Jai spots, at the hookah lounges, at the masjids, at auntie's houses for dawahs, and at eat prayer. I just wasn't seeing what I was seeing in real life when I was you know, watching television. But there was one particular story that really made us continue this journey even till today to all, all these different projects that we're doing. And it happened in Montana. Um, Montana is a, a beautiful state, uh, mashallah, and from what I understand, it was the, one of the only states in the entire country that doesn't have a single masjid, like an actual like dedicated built or building for masjid. The Muslims there pray on a college campus. To get halal meat, they actually order FedEx uh, from a farm in a different state to get it shipped to you. And so I went to this auntie's house and she was making food for us and she's like, I'll make you guys anything. Um, and I was like, all right, uh, 
Do you have any like lamb? She's like, oh, not, not, not till Friday. Like we have to wait for the UPS truck to come. Um, so we're in Montana. We're driving. It's a beautiful state, just soaking in these really, really lush mountainscapes. We're in the car. We're bumping to Selena Gomez's new album, Don't Judge Me for My Music Choices. And so we're driving, and it's a beautiful day, and I see this garbage bag on the road. And I don't think anything of it. I just start driving. I go over the garbage bag, and boom! We, it actually turned out to be a rock. And smoke is coming out from the back of the car. And I start freaking out because we got a rental car from Enterprise. A buddy of mine gave us this crazy hookup. And so we had smoke coming out from the back of the car. And I'm freaking out like Enterprise is going to kill us. And so I pull over and I wait for the, um, the car to cool down. And wait for the car to cool down. And smoke is, goes away and the car's not starting. I'm like, oh man, it's not starting. It's not starting. What do we do? And so we're stuck in the mountains. Um, we have to get to town to write about the, the Muslims over there. So we don't have any time to waste. And so we're like, all right, we'll just call AAA, we'll get the car fixed later, and then we'll go to town, fix it later, but we gotta pray, we gotta meet the Muslims, we gotta write about it. And so we pull out our cell phones, no reception in the mountains. So we're stuck in the mountains, have no idea where we are, like, what do we do? And so my buddy, bless his heart, comes up with a brilliant plan. He's like, all right, man, this is what's going down. I'm gonna hitch a ride into town. I'm gonna go get cell phone reception once I get there. I'll call AAA. Amon, how about you wait here by yourself in the middle of the mountains where you can't call from? What a brilliant plan. Let's do it. So he leaves, he catches a ride, and he goes into town. And I'm just sitting in the car. And he said he'd be like 15 minutes. 15 minutes becomes 20 minutes. 20 minutes becomes 30 minutes. 30 minutes becomes 40 minutes. Then it's an hour goes by. And he's still not here. And I can't call him. And so I'm waiting, and then I'm just looking out the road. And then I see uh, a bunch of deer just run across the highway. I was like, okay. And then I see a bunch of coyotes change after them. I was like, chase after them. I'm like, okay, time to lock the doors. All right. And um, then I see a grizzly bear run across the road. I'm like, did I break my knuckle today? Like, what's happening? I'm like, I'm going to die in these mountains. Like, where is he? Like, I'm so freaking out. And so all of a sudden, as I'm freaking out about this bear, I hear this thunderous noise in the background and a horn honking that chases the bear away. And I look behind me and it was a tow truck. And so the tow truck pulls up and my buddy Bassam gets out of the car. And I'm going to tell you a little story about our tow truck driver. Ken, the tow truck driver, gets out of the truck. I'm going to tell you about Ken. This man has one of the most baller mustaches I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, I'm convinced that that's not even a mustache. That's his lips being protected by the wings of an angel, right? It's beautiful. It's marvelous. And my buddy Basam, he's the one, mashallah, that took all the photos on the trip. And I'm just daydreaming about this man's mustache as he pulls up our car. And so I get in the, tr I get in the truck with Ken, and my buddy Basam pulls out his camera, and uh, uh, goes up to Ken, and he's like, hey, Ken, um, can you smile for the camera? And he was like, I am smiling. <laughs> so we start driving and uh, he's taking us to town and we're in Bozeman, Montana and I look out the window and I see where those arrows are pointed. I see all these crosses on the side of the road. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. This must be a really religious town. I'm sure there's a lot of cool things we could learn about the Muslims uh, here in Montana. And Ken was like, no, 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 no. That's not from religion. Those are gravestones of people that have died here in Montana because apparently you ever watch the show Ice Road Truckers? Any hicks like me? Nobody? Okay. Um, anyway, this is one of the most dangerous roads in all of Montana because there's no traffic lights or signs or anything like that. A lot of animals like to run across the road and people hit them and die. And so Ken was telling us that there's a lot of mountain sheep that like to kick rocks off the hills. And that's probably what we ran over when we were driving. So we finally get to town. We prayed with the Muslims there. They have a small little space. And we're freaking out because we got to get this car fixed. We gotta go to uh, Fargo, North Dakota, the next day. And so we gotta get this car fixed in the morning. And the latest we can leave is like 12 o'clock in order to make it from Ungrip uh, at like eight or nine o'clock. And so we wake up super early the next day. Uh, the, uh, the mechanic fixes our car, but it takes way too long. At this point, it's two o'clock. Yo, we cannot go to Fargo. What do we do? So I literally jumped on Google and typed in Muslims in North Dakota. And Google said back, did you mean Muslims in Chicago? And we started looking around and we found this article um, that came up in Google about a mosque 
in Ross, North Dakota, a town of only 40 or 50 people, and according to this article, has the first masjid that was ever built in the United States. And of all places, North Dakota. It's like, what? Why not Chicago? Why not LA or New York or Houston? Of all places, Chicago or uh, North Dakota. And so we're like, all right, this is dope. How do we find this place? There's no website for the mosque. There's no phone number. There's nobody to contact. And this article was on a blog written like five or six years ago. We're like, man, we don't even know this place is still there. And so I look around on Google Maps. I couldn't find the mosque, but I found a Muslim cemetery in Ross, North Dakota. I'm like, okay, this town can't be too big. There's a Muslim cemetery. There's got to be a mosque nearby. And so completely relying on this map, didn't even have an address, it just had an intersection. Completely relying on an intersection, we put in our GPS, we drove five to six hours to Ross, North Dakota. So we start driving, and my buddy is calling all the people, anybody he can find in North Dakota. He calls the mayor, he's like, hey, uh, is there a mosque there? And he's like, I don't know what a mosque is. Um, I know what a church is, call the church. So we call the church. We're like, hey, is there a mosque here? He's like, I don't know, call the priest. The priest gets us in touch with this woman named Lila. She's like, I think she's Muslim. So we call, we call Lila, and she's Muslim, like, awesome. And she's actually the caretaker of the mosque. And she's like, hey, it's a little less bit of notice. I can't open the mosque for you, but you're more than welcome to look at it from the outside. I'm like, okay, great. So we head up to North Dakota. I'm a little tight on time, I apologize. Um, I head up to North Dakota, and we start driving. And I don't know where I'm going. I'm just completely relying on the GPS. There's no highway signs. There's no gas stations we can stop and ask for directions or anything like that. So I'm completely relying on GPS. And the map on the GPS tells us that we're getting close. And we get to Ross, North Dakota. And Ross, when we're there, the map says um, that if you look down the road, um, that the intersection will be right up ahead down this dirt road. So I take this turn. It's not like there's a sign for the mosque or anything. I take a turn and I look all the way out in the horizon and I see absolutely nothing. And so I try to call Lila back. She's not picking up. It goes to voicemail. It's almost mother time. I gotta write about this. I don't know what to do. And so we start getting frustrated. I'm like, man, this is whatever. And so my friend was like, man, it's all your fault if you didn't run over that rock. I'm like, man, you're mama. And so we start arguing back and forth. We're yelling in the car, we're bickering, just yelling and yelling and yelling. And as I'm driving, I look to the right outside my window and I see this. And so you can see the mosque in the background and the little gate, you know, the crescent and the star, you know, a popular symbol associated with Islam. And there's the mosque. Like, here's a close up shot of it. It almost looks like Allah SWT like, took a toy and just dropped it onto this prayer, right? And it was amazing. And so my friend was standing close to where the sun is like, hey, check this out. And he pulls out his camera and he found the cemetery. And we found things like Nazir Omar, born in 1908, uh, Ahmed Jaha, Korean war veteran. We found Muslims that are World War II veterans, World War I veterans, and Muslims born in the 1800s. And of all places, they were living in Ross, North Dakota. And I didn't know anything about these people. I didn't know anything about this community. I had so many questions about these interesting people. I was like, what do we do? And so we call Lila and she finally gets in touch with us. And we call her like, Lila, I know you can't meet us tonight, but we're staying here overnight. Um, can you meet with us this morning? We would love to learn about this beautiful place that you have here in North Dakota. So she agrees to meet with us and she opened up the mosque for us in the morning. It's a very, very small prayer space. It's a very small rug and a few photographs of their ancestors. That's it. And this is Lila. She is a seventh generation Muslim American. Her ancestors came here. Sorry, eighth generation. Ancestors came here in the 1700s. So I asked her, I was like, Lila, of all places, how did you guys end up here in North Dakota? Why not Chicago? Why not Philly? Why not LA? Like, or the big cities? Like, how'd you guys get up here? And she was telling me that her ancestors originally came from Lebanon in Syria. And during the time in the 1700s and 1800s, the Ottoman Empire was spreading all throughout the Middle East, right? And a lot of these Lebanese uh, and Syrian farmers were like, yo, I don't want anything to do with war. We're just trying to farm. But everybody was required to fight at the time. And so they didn't want anything to do with it, but they heard in America there was an act called the Homestead Act, where if you farm land for a few years, you could keep it. So thousands of Lebanese, Syrian farmers from all over came to places like uh, Ross, North Dakota, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Evansville, Indiana, Toledo, Ohio, and lived there peacefully for generations. And I asked Lila, I was like, let me ask you something. You went to school in the 1930s and 1940s. Race relations were bad enough between white people and black people then. Uh, what was it like for you though? Being the only Muslim, being the only Arab, the only minority in a town of only 40 or 50 people. And she told me, she said, it was fun. Because at the end of the day, we were all farmers. Didn't matter what we believed. 
didn't matter how we prayed to God. At the end of the day, we were all barbers. And this is a narrative that I don't see on television. There's a narrative that people hate Muslims, Muslims hate other people, but everywhere you go, everywhere you go, um, we found these narratives. And so as uh, we're getting ready to leave, she has to sign the guest book. And I wrote in the guest book, um, you know, I'll never forget the contributions that you and your family have made in this country. And I'm making a promise to you that I hope that nobody else ever will. And to think that one of the reasons we got a chance to visit this awesome place of American history is because we ran over that rock in Montana. Uh, I'm, I have to wrap it up. Um, but this is the narrative that you don't see of Muslims, right? Um, this guy is a hafiz of the Quran um, in the Bay Area. Um, you know, you've got your, your old school uncles, got to give them death. Uh, you've got, uh, as I said, Muslims in the 1800s, uh, I'm sorry, this is Muslims in the 1940s and this is them today. Um, the Somali cab drivers, uh, there's this guy that married uh, a Mormon woman, and they're going to have some hot babies, uh, inshallah, when um, they grow up. Uh, the Cambodian Muslims. Uh, we found uh, a, mo um, a masjid in Abiquiu, New Mexico, two miles high in uh, the mountains. And just a beautiful, has more of a Native American kind of feel for it. I could go on and on and on. There were just so many interesting narratives. And what was cool is after we did our project, people started reaching out to us like, uh, people in Indonesia, Holland, Chicago, LA, New York, Philly, India, Pakistan, China. We're like, hey, I love what you guys are doing. We're doing 30 mosques in 30 days. We're in our own community, which was awesome about it because the 30 mosques started about this crazy tweet that my friend and I had a couple years back. Now, Hamla has blossomed into this beautiful global movement where people aren't relying on other people to tell the stories. They say, you know what? Nobody's going to understand us until we tell our own stories. And so what happened is a crazy tweet has now blossomed, Hamla, into this beautiful, uh, global movement. I'm a little tight on time, so I do apologize for going over. Forgive me, Sean. Um, but I'll be around for Q&A if you have any other stuff. So that's it. Bye-bye. Jazakallah khairan, brother Aman. Again, alhamdulillah, like he said, we could speak on and on for hours, and we wouldn't get bored. Alhamdulillah. So again, he's going to be speaking, inshallah, in room number 31. And... Uh, Alhamdulillah, he's going to be talking about the transformative power of the Muslim social web, which is going to be in room number 31, straight after, inshallah, this, this event we've got here. So next, inshallah, I'd like to invite uh, Jamil Sayyid, who's also called Jamal Adin. He's an author, an international speaker, an executive that resides in Auburn Hills, Michigan. And he loves the uh, University of Michigan. Big time. Alhamdulillah, don't get him upset, whatever you do, on that matter. It's okay, we're Inshallah. Now, so, Alhamdulillah, Brother Jamil, the initiative he had is hitting the 50 states and making the Adhan in the 50 states. Alhamdulillah, he went across 35,000 miles to do this in 35 days. Alhamdulillah. So he's been named the title of 50 Mosque Man. And Alhamdulillah, he's also got an initiative where he's selling some USB sticks for uh, $20, inshallah, which, has been, which are there to promote his, his uh, next, inshallah, endeavors. So without further ado, inshallah, we've got Brother Jamil Sayyid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's more like Alhamdulillah. One second, I just have to pull this up. So. First of all, I'd like to really thank all of you who have taken out your time to be here today. It's, uh, we know we have a lot of options, you know, mashallah, you know, and um, you did come out over here to do the different things, you know, that uh, we're looking to do. And um, I, I really want to thank Sister Hina and Brother Shtiyah and, and, you know, Brother Aman over here. The uh, entire initiative this year for ISNA 
happens to be revolving around Muslims authoring their own narratives. And if you really take a look at the work that these people have done on this particular panel, you know, Hina tells stories and tales about Muslims every single day. Muslim Matters, which of, of which I'm a contributor, happens to be the most influential blog for Muslim Americans in the entire country. So uh, it speaks a lot that she holds on to her tradition and that she's a female representing us the way that she does. So I'd like to give a round of applause you know, for her to be able to do it as well. And then there's not a lot of personalities that we have basically penetrated mainstream that represent you know, uh, the different social aspects of Muslim country or culture, and that's where we have uh, Brother Aman, and then uh, Sheikh Ishtiyaf is, you know, very, very close to me. You know, mashallah, we have this relationship. We're from the same community, Islamic Association of Greater Detroit. He studied in Hadramaut, he studied in Syria. He's the director of Islamic studies. He's very, very, very humble in the Huda school. And he's actually gonna be coming out with his own series called The Companions, and he'll be uh, a speaker, inshallah, uh, giving this lecture nationally. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. There's very very little time here, um, and as we could probably attest to, when you attend, when you go on any type of epic journey, one of the things that is going to happen inevitably is that you're going to have a lot of idiosyncratic things hit you. That means that there are going to be a lot of surprises and you're going to have to change and you're going to have to adapt to whatever the situation is. That's how you pull off these types of trips. So even now, time is not our friend. We have other sessions that we have to go through and we're going to have to improvise. So I'm going to be very, very acute with regards to the words that I give you. And inshallah, I want to make sure there's at least 5-10 minutes for Q&A because you as an audience deserve that. My story began when I was 11 years old. I was in the Michigan Islamic Academy in sixth grade, and I remember that there was no one else in the masjid except for my teacher, Brother Isa Abdul Basir. And he was making the adhan, he's African American. And there's something about the way that he was making the adhan, you know, the sincerity, although there was no one else there that he's doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it just really, really touched my heart. But I was a very, very shy boy, so what I used to do is I used to go into the corner and practice, you know, the adhan by myself. I didn't want to come in front of people. One day he caught me and he said, why don't you come in front and do this? You know, because I said, well, I, I was just messing around. He said, no, you should come. And he pulled me up in front of the assembly. The whole school was over there. Uh, and he just called me out and he asked me to make the adhan at that point. And then he said something very peculiar. He said, maybe one day you'll be making the adhan in all of America, right? And I think there were some angels in that room that said Amin to that. Because this past October I turned 40 and I was writing this book called The 99 Scenarios of uh, Business in Muslim in America. I'm actually the CEO of a marketing firm. I've been so for 10 years and I thought after 700 plus case studies it's about time to go ahead and write a book on this matter. And the fact of the matter is that I was in a writer's block. This is in January. And I started you know, going off and wandering into different thoughts and different ideas. And I remembered my father. That's the first thing that came to my mind. He was a professor of microbiology at the University of Michigan. He went to go pray, Salatul Taraweeh uh, at the Masjid. And he was lucky enough to get the Jama'ah of Isha. And then he was praying Salatul Sunnah in the second Raka'ah, in the second Sajda, he passed away. So when a person turns 40, you start to rewind and you start to think about all of these different things. What have I accomplished? And he passed away in sujood saying subhanahu rabbi al you know, and obviously he's made his bones and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown what his status is inshallah. But what have I accomplished in 40 years? So although I was in Masjid al Nabawi in Hajj, you know, uh, two months after his demise, and I made this intention to serve the community and I opened up this firm. The reality is that they took whatever benefit from me and I took whatever benefit from those 700 plus accounts. But what have I done? And I think to myself, I've got this young man in front of me who basically wakes me up every single day. I don't have an alarm to the tilawah of Quran at the time of tahajjud. He's memorized 19 juz, mashallah, and he's spending his youth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think to myself, how can I compete with this? So the man in front of me and the man behind me, both are, inshallah, very good graces with 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what about me? And I tell you, that a person reaches a conclusion that you are but miskeen. You are a poor person. For all your titles and degrees and all of the money which you have earned, you don't have anything at the end of the day. So one of my teachers, as I was coming to the masjid, pulled me aside because he saw you know, the expression on my face and they asked me what was the matter. And I explained to him what I just explained to you. So he said, I have glad tidings for you. Don't you know the muqam that Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have given to the mu'adhan? Don't you know that when the mu'adhan makes the adhan, anything that his voice touches will testify for him on the day of judgment? Don't you know that when the mu'adhan will be raised on qiyamah, he will have the highest neck or he will have the tallest stature? And that means that he will see the mercy of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala before anyone else does it. That means he will taste it. Don't you know that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had called Bilal Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu close to him and he said, what have you done so special? And then the Sahabi asked him why. He said, because I am the one who entered Jannah first and I heard your footsteps ahead of me. This is the Mu'addin al-Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't you know that when the Mu'addin makes the Adhan and the people come, they all get Hasana? But don't you know that every carbon copy is given to the Mu'addin? You're a mu'adhan to go make the adhan. So subhanAllah, I made some shura, I did istikhara, and I went out on this journey. Uh, a lot of people told me, so all relief organizations, Life for Relief and Development, Syrian American Medical Society, Helping Hands, the God Foundation, they said, give us one more month. We can raise all the money for you. But, you know, once you endeavor on doing something like this, you, know, you, you have this antsiness, you know, maybe somebody else will come first. Maybe I won't make it until next week. Maybe I'll change my mind. So I left my home. My wife was having surgery on that day on the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And before I left, I consulted with my teacher. He said that, what about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa I said that I will praise him, inshallah. A'udhu billahi min shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صدق الله العظيم For when the name of Muhammad is mentioned and this is the only ayah which stands differentiated from all the other ayahs in the Quran. When the name of mentioned, Allah says that myself and my angel send salutations onto the messenger. So all oh, you who believe, send him a worthy salutation. So my teacher said, how will you praise him? So he said, I will praise him in such a manner, inshallah, to bring the best kalam and the kalam of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa to the people. So what the media missed is that along with the call to prayer, in every single masjid, we also recited the khutbatul wida of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa to every single individual. And those are thousands of people who happen to make it over there. And due to time, I'm going to move directly into the situation. There's so many things to say. And I'll just say one thing before I do. This wristband which I'm wearing right now, I visited the father of Diya Baraka. And I took this off of his wrist. And 62 times since that day, I have traveled across the United States and given this khutbah al wada and I said that I'm going to champion your children. So make dua for his children, inshallah. But now I'm going to bring to you the most eloquent speech ever to be conducted in the history of humanity. For we have Martin Luther King, and we have Gandhi, and we have Steve Jobs, and we have Walt Disney, all great visionaries, all people that have had a tremendous impact on this society. All people who wish other people take their words and they've institutionalized them, they've made huge monuments, they swear by them and all sorts of philosophies, but I swear, as I'm in front of you in the largest gathering here in North America of Muslim Americans, this is the speech of the Qanam of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all those other speeches lie within the shadow of this speech. Now imagine 200 plus thousand Sahabis there, some that have been with him from the beginning and some who have actually just come at towards the end. But one thing they all have in common is that they would all hear the words of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa for the last time. On the 9th of Dhul-Hijjah and the 10th year of Hijrah in the Uruna Valley of Mount Arafah, after praising and thanking Allah, the Messenger of Allah, Sayyidina Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa said, 
O people, lend me an attentive ear, for I know not whether after this year I shall ever be amongst you again. Therefore, listen to what I'm saying to you very carefully, and take these words to those that could not be here today. O people, just as you regard this month, this day, this city is sacred, so regard the life and property of every Muslim as a sacred trust. Return the goods entrusted to you to their rightful owners. Hurt no one, so that no one may hurt you. Remember that you will indeed meet your Lord and that He will indeed reckon your deeds. Allah has forbidden you to take usury. Therefore, all interest obligations shall henceforth be waived. Your capital, however, is yours to keep. You will neither inflict nor suffer any inequity. Allah has judged that there shall be no interest and that all interest due to Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib shall henceforth be waived. Beware of shaitan for the safety of your religion, for he has lost all hope that he will ever be able to lead you astray in big things. So beware of following him in small things. O oh people, it is true that you have certain rights with regards to your women, but they also have certain rights with regards to you. Remember that you have taken them as your wives only under Allah's trust and with His permission. If they abide by your right, then to them belong the right to be fed and clothed in kindness. Do treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are your partners and committed helpers. And it is your right that they do not make friends with anyone whom you do not approve, as well as to never be unchaste. O oh people, listen to me in earnest. Worship Allah, say your five daily prayers, Fast in the month of Ramadan, pay your zakah and perform hajj if you can do so. All mankind is from Adam and Eve. An Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a black has no superiority over a white, nor a white has any superiority over a black except for piety and good action. Learn that every Muslim is a brother to every other Muslim and that all Muslims constitute one brotherhood. Nothing shall be legitimate to a Muslim which belongs to a fellow Muslim unless it was given freely and willingly. Do not therefore do injustice to yourselves. Remember that one day you will appear before Allah and answer for your deeds. So be aware, do not stray from the path of righteousness after I am gone. O people, no prophet or apostle shall come after me and no new faith shall be born. Reason well therefore, O people, and understand the words which I convey to you. I leave behind me two things, the Qur'an and my example, the Sunnah. And if you follow these, you will never go astray. All those who listen to me shall pass on my words to others and those to others again. And may the last ones understand my words better than those who listen to me directly. Be my witness, O oh Allah, that I have conveyed to you your message to your people. Now, in today's day and age, we have complex problems. And we try to find complex solutions to complex problems. But that's now how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought this religion down. Simplified solutions to complex problems. For this three minute speech, 1400 years ago, addresses gender equity, social equity, racial justice, the rights of men and women, brotherhood, unity. All we have to do is belong to this legacy that was given to the Sahaba, to the Taba'in that's been echoing through the centuries and through the generations. So I ask you, please, however many people there are in this room. As we mentioned, we have the USB sticks, you know, that we are selling, you know, uh, in the back that have this button without on there. And they have the adans which I made. We're taking the proceeds of those, and I'll be going on tour, inshallah. And as you saw in the previous slide before, I will be going to the different communities. And in these communities, we will be relaying the entire story from A through Z, several pictures, but we will be reading this. And some of the indigenous population, communities that can't afford, we're gonna go ahead and take the proceeds and make sure that they can also have this mosque as well. I thank you all very much for your time. We'll have pictures inshallah in the back. I know that we're pressed for it, but we wanna give the podium to these speakers so that you can answer whatever question. Jazakumullah khayr, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, thank you very much Brother Jameel for your inspiring words. We've got like five to ten minutes of question and answer and then there's another session in here. I'm sure the brothers want to set up for that. So we've got about five minutes for question and answer if anybody's got a question. Any questions?
that's a very difficult question. Um, I think one of, okay, I'll talk about this piece. I, I wrote a piece on sexual harassment in, um, is, is it a Muslim problem? And um, even though it was a very diff I think it was a difficult piece to write, um, but it was very comprehensive because we, I did a lot of um, um, research and uh, just, uh, uh, you know, a lot of times when we, we talk to um, sort of like the conservative traditional uh, uh, spectrum of our community, it's very hard to talk about these problems. But even, and it generated like thousands and thousands of comments and people were at it uh, in the comments. But it started a conversation that we weren't having, and later so many more. Um, uh, it, it had a top, like this effect on other communities. People were uh, using it in their um, work. Um, they were having conversations about that in their masajid, and that's what really. Um, I think that whole series on um, sex and the ummah has been really, really a, a powerful um, a series for myself. I started. Um, uh, workshops on sexual abuse and uh, um, uh, teaching puberty to young kids based on uh, one of the articles that was in that series, um, A Muslim's Guide to Puberty. So I think that was really, uh, that was one of my favorite pieces as on the, on the blog. As for articles, mm, probably the Yeager piece. That was just, it was just, it's just, I didn't know their history. I didn't know that they were occupied by China. You know, you just hear about them, or they're Chinese Muslims, but just learning, I learned so much, and I'm like thinking, oh, I think I'm so enlightened, whatever. I don't know anything, look, as, imagine, what, no, none of us know that, so that was probably my other second. Thank you very much. Any other questions? <laughs> You know, we, it's really important that um, we pay homage to the folks that make our journeys possible. And really, like some of our communities, subhanAllah, they're just, they're just so vibrant and so, I mean, when I hear all these unmasked stories and all of that, I'm like, subhanAllah, you don't know what you're missing out on. I mean, there are, you, you know, people are talking, complaining about the youth and blah, blah, blah. I go into Masajid, the Masajid are filled, the parking lots are filled, people are loving it. They're, I, there are problems, I, I get it, but just we have to be optimistic. We have to know that our youth are in the right place. You know, uh, during Ramadan, you'll see them in the masjid all night long praying. I mean, I don't remember my childhood like that. I lived in a Muslim country. I don't remember that. The things are happening here that aren't happening anywhere else in the world, and I really, really think we need to highlight the positive. Um, also, that's why a couple of stories that I do is like, what were Muslims doing after the Boston bombing? What were Muslims doing after the, during the Baltimore uprising? And you'll find them on the streets, cleaning up, helping out, distributing food, doing so much that never gets highlighted. And that is why I really, really believe Muslim media needs to be supported. There needs to be a Muslim newspaper in every city run by Muslims. You know, you all need to be writing for it, editing it, going out, taking pictures for it, write your own stories, blog, do whatever. Seriously, we need to write our own narrative, and alhamdulillah, these two amazing men who have gone out into, I mean, they have a lot of privilege. I, was, I wish I could do that too, you know? It, it, it's really hard moving in sacred spaces while you're a woman. Uh, just getting in the door is really tough, you know? And with all these FBI insurgencies and all of that, people think, oh, you know, who is this woman? Why is she asking me so many questions? And it's really hard getting interviews and stuff. But, you just have to be positive and inshallah, you know, things work out. Again, Jazakallah Khairan for everybody coming out. Any questions? Just the last question, maybe. I feel like I work at Burger King this week. Go for it. <laughs> uh, do you have, what's your next adventure? Um, I mean, I'm always traveling and performing. Uh, the project that he mentioned uh, is a project doing with Google called Homegrown Homies, and it's basically just telling interesting stories about the American Muslim community. The fact that the Muslim is irrelevant, they're just human interest stories. And so, for example, we did one on um, this issue of Muslims and dogs. It's been a little, people kind of debated, can you have a pet, can you not have a pet? I didn't want to get into that. There's been, mashallah, incredible articles written about it. Uh, but Dr. Ingrid Madsen, very prominent uh, scholar and uh, speaker here at ISNA, um, she has a dog. 
And rather than getting to the issue, I said, I just want to do a story about her and her dog. Um, so just a fun story about her and her dog, Ziggy. And, his, um, and then what else? Um, there's been another issue. We've just been doing episodes. Uh, another episode we did. Um, in Newark, New Jersey, there's three to four Muslims every week getting gunned down in the streets. Um, and it's gotten to the point that like they can't have janazas at the masjids because they're afraid of being targeted. So they have to have them just sporadically at people's houses. And this is the same community where you have masjids that are 10, 11, 12 million dollar masjids being built and there's kids dying in the streets miles away. They're not even a few miles away. And so we wanted to talk about these stories. And so Google's been great uh, to work with and they've given us this awesome platform um, through their network and stuff like that to be able to go out and tell these awesome stories. And so we've just been hitting the country uh, telling stories, and so we've been dropping them uh, probably like once a month. Um, it's uh, youtube.com slash homegrown homies. You can check out some of the episodes. So. Comment number two is this for here to go. Jazakallah <laughs> khairan for coming out to this session. Alhamdulillah, we're going to conclude now. And uh, inshallah, follow them wherever they go because it's really inspiring, like they said. Also, our sister here, Muslim matters. You benefited from it. Everybody's benefited from it. So, inshallah, you know, again, alhamdulillah, give them a, a great round of applause. Thank you. So quickly, Jabril is out there with the USB sticks. If anyone would like to support that endeavor, please. Uh, Modern day Ibn Battista. Okay. This is a 51 mask guy. Uh, 2 30, 3 30 p.m., 14 in room 27. Thank you. And once again, I'm Bill Gunny. Yeah.